All right. Well, hi, everybody. Um, thank you all uh, so much for joining our first webinar of the year. Uh, my name is Courtney Smith, and I am the Executive Marketing Manager here at Visible Body, and I am joined today by uh, uh, three of my colleagues, um, Carly Strawn and Matt Smars from the VB Education team, and uh, Kate Burns, one of our Customer Engagement Specialists, who will be walking you all through the basics of using VB Courseware. Now, if, um, if you're new to our webinars, here's how this is going to go. Uh, Kate is going to uh, launch into her presentation and uh, occasionally we will pause and, uh, and take some questions. Um, and you'll probably notice that you are muted. That is um, done purposefully. So um, as you think of questions, please post them into the chat and uh, we will try to get to as many as we possibly can. And um, if for any reason uh, you need to jump off the Zoom at any point or you want to watch this presentation again, I will be sending a recording of this uh, tomorrow via email. So um, keep an eye out for that. And um, you uh, can watch uh, all of our webinars and our office hour sessions on our YouTube channel. And I am actually going to post uh, the links to those um, right now. We have them in playlists on YouTube. Um, I'm going to pop those into the chat right now. So, um, okay, I, I believe that was all I, uh, I wanted to say. So uh, I'm going to hand things over to Kate. Kate, they're all yours. Hello all and welcome. Um, so glad you could all join us today. Uh, so we've just put together a short list of things to get started, key things that uh, is basically, so now I have a, a courseware, now what? Um, <laughs> so today we'll cover, um, you know, how to access our pre-made courses, getting your course up off the ground and, and getting people inviting people to the course, getting your students into the grade book, uh, knowing the different types of assignments that we've created for our pre-built courses, um, and then how to edit that content. We'll talk a little bit about quizzing, and then at the end, um, instructor resources. And of course, please feel free to ask questions throughout. We'll pause, as Courtney said, um, to make sure that we can get up to everyone's questions. So uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay, and you should be seeing the My Apps page for my courseware account. I'm getting nods, so that's good. All right, so right now, uh, and if you've uh, gotten your login, if you've logged in already and started playing around in courseware, uh, this page should look pretty familiar to you. Uh, you'll see the list of courses. Now, I do have a pretty long list here, but that's just because I'm constantly pulling courses in throughout my day while I'm doing trainings with folks. Your list will probably have one or two sample courses in it or and any course that uh, you might have pulled into your account already. Um, so, First things first is uh, this really wonderful link up here on the top right. This is our pre-made courses. Uh, and if you click here, you can search through the list of these textbook correlations that we have built so that we're pointing all of the visible body content that we have on any given subject and putting it in an order uh, that you'll recognize from, from your textbook. Uh, we do have a lot of good options. If you're looking through this list and you, you don't find exactly what you're looking for, just let us know. Uh, it, it's possible we already have it. We just don't have it posted here yet. Or we could, of course, try and, and um, work something out and, and get one for you to get a correlation for that specific book. So just let us know. We're always happy to help. Um, and literally, all you have to do to get one of these is click this. Let's see, AMP for healthcare. I'm going to add that into my account. You can update your course name and edit your start, first start date and your first assignment due date here. That is always editable. So you can always go back and change that if you wanna instead have it uh, the course be the name of this particular section or um, you know what whatever you're calling that course for your students. Um, and let's see, where did that one populate into? It was 
A and P. Well, that's loading it. <laughs> so I'm just going to go in one of our more popular, uh, the, the name uh, textbook that I see more often is Marie. So I'm going to just pull that up here. Um, so all of these are completely customizable. And if you can actually just drag and drop these sections, uh, you can rename them right here with these little drop downs. You can make a copy or rename that. Uh, for example, a lot of people like to have these folders match up with their syllabus exactly. So whatever you're calling that week in your syllabus, uh, you might want to change the names of these to be that. Um, also, in all of our pre-made courses, the first assignment is always the getting started with Visible Body and Courseware apps. Um, it's always really helpful so that the students get those questions answered right here rather than coming to you every single time they have a question. Um, we try to get that out of the way right up at the top. Um, so yeah, that, that's completely customizable. You can change the names here. Uh, then, so how do we get people into the course? So inviting our students or other instructors, uh, depending on your LMS, so what learning system you're using. Uh, if you do have Canvas, um, your method is gonna be slightly different. So just keep that in mind as we go through this invite people link. Um, but uh, we can always, if you have questions, if you do have Canvas and have questions on how to get that uh, linked up, we, we can go up over that together or set up another session. Um, so for everybody else, <laughs> you would just click this invite people link right here. And it'll bring you to this page, which will be unique for this course. So if you're ever unsure what course you're inviting people to, you can always check in this upper left-hand corner to make sure you're inviting the right group to the right course. And you simply just copy that link and you can distribute that however works best for you, either in a post on uh, your course, you can send it out by email, however works best for you and your students. So as the students, you know, follow this link, they'll sign up to Visible Body uh, and start getting populated into your class roster and the grade book. And I'll actually, I'm gonna jump back, oh, I always do that, jump back to a class that actually has students in it so I can show you uh, what that will look like. So I actually invited a couple of people, uh, friends here at Visible Body to take a couple of quizzes so that we could see what a grade book looks like when there's students in it. Um, so you can scroll over and see all of their scores and, and these will get the names will get added here into the roster as they uh, sign up for the class as they create their courseware user account. Okay. So once they're in and they've got their user account and they're ready to hit the ground running. Um, what do what will the students be able to see? So here up on the top in this blue ribbon here is the student preview. And if you just toggle that on, you'll see that these are uh, the things I happen to have published already in this course. Um, so that is what the students can see. And as you see here, these they're grayed out because the release date has been set for the future. So uh, they know that that's coming, but it's not accessible to them yet. And I'll show you how to edit those release dates so that you can um, have, have the course kind of run on autopilot. Uh, someone said in, in my last meeting, they like to set it and forget it and get everything set up in advance so that you know it just kind of happens, the date comes by and it'll publish for the students and they'll have access to that. Um, when the student preview is off, another really quick and easy way to see what's been published. Okay, let's go down here because we know all of these have been published. Um, you, you can see here when it has the word draft in parentheses after, that means it has not yet been published. And also this little icon here uh, says that it's not visible to students, so it's not been published. If we compare that to one of the ones up here where Oops, I know we published, there they go. So we've definitely published this. You can see it doesn't have the word draft directly after the name and it does have the check mark 
check icon, check icon uh, listed right there in green. So you can uh, see that. You can also see here the release date and the due date for those assignments. Um, so we try to show you that info in a couple of different places. And I just accidentally moved my getting started question quiz here. So you can move that right back up in. Um, any questions so far just on publishing, any, any of that? inviting students? Um, actually, uh, we do have one uh, from Sarah, uh, who is a Canvas user. Um, would you be able to show uh, Sarah and any other Canvas user um, in this uh, webinar right now how they might um, invite their students? Sure. Um, so with Canvas, it's a, it's a, light integration so what it'll what that means is that your students will only have to do a single sign on to the canvas account and will link your canvas account with your courseware account um, so to do that you'll you'll need a secret and key so uh you'll get that through who whichever uh, you know rep you've been working with uh they'll they'll get that distributed to you uh if you're unsure uh just reach out and i'll find out who your rep is and get that for you and we'll get that taken care of um in terms of the the nitty-gritty I, I maybe we'll do that in another session i think um but you can go there's resources on how to get that set up and get those courses linked there's a really uh, handy dandy video that will also show you that um and i'll show you where when we get to the the instructor resources portion um just because that's that's very that's very specific only to Canvas users. Uh, everyone else will use this invite people link. But if you do have Canvas, the course is going to be linked to your Canvas course, so you're not going to need the invite people link. And that's that's really the main difference is you're just link you're linking those two things together so that your students don't have to follow an external link to get into their courseware. Um, Okay, uh, so yep, um, so we covered that. Were there any other questions on anything before I moved on to the bulk editing? We just had another one in the chat. Um, that question is, is is this a separate purchase from the ZSpace app? Um, and technically, yes, they're two different um, purchases depending on what your school subscription is. Um, you should talk to your rep about that and they can help you a little bit further depending on what you've purchased at your institution. If that helps answer that, Sandy. Thank you, Carly. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what ZSpace is, so I'm gonna do a little bit of Googling after this. <laughs> Like a, a different type of computer. Um, oh, okay. If you have ZSpace, you're probably with Rob Kneebone is my guess. Um, and so you should talk to him. He's He would probably be your rep, which if you don't have his email address, we're more than happy to put that in the chat for you. Um, so there is a way when you open up any one of these, uh, if you want to publish them individually, just by going into that assignment, going down here and saying, this is the one, I'm ready to publish it, publish it right from there. Um, but when you have a you know, months long course with lots of content, uh, that's not very time efficient to go through assignment by assignment. So we do have this wonderful bulk editing tool here and you'll use this to publish, unpublish, uh, as well as set your release dates and due dates. Um, so what this does is it just adds this little column here with check boxes, um, which you can either select all or some of. Um, you can also choose which ones within a folder, which assignments within a folder you would like uh, to publish. So, and actually, no, okay, that's good. I was like, I was making sure that it wasn't already published. Um, so I just quickly checked. It still has that word draft and it still has a uh, grayed out circle. Um, so I know that those do need to be published, but these ones don't. So I've selected the few that I'm going to publish for today. And then I can go ahead and click publish. And now if we toggle on the student preview, everything now is published. And uh, 
you can also see that those particular assignments no longer have the word draft after them and, and they have the green chat box. Um, so that's kind of how, you know, you'll take the, the pre-made courses, you'll take that starting point that we've made for you and then kind of quickly and easily customize it for your needs so that um, you can really hit the ground running with these uh, either by getting everything set up um, so that it happens automatically or just publishing it in chunks as you go so that you don't have to have that setup time at all. Um, all right. So uh, knowing the different type of uh, types of assignments that you'll encounter uh, in our pre-made courses. So we've created a couple of name, naming conventions that uh, you'll see throughout any of the pre-made courses. Uh, you'll see modules, anatomy ID, practice quizzes, graded quizzes, lab activities. Um, and each one of those is going to point you towards different different types of content within either one of our apps or uh, lab activities that we've made. There, those are PDFs. And so I'm just going to go over kind of what you can find in each one of those so that you can quickly identify the types of things that will be most beneficial for you. Uh, starting with the modules. So anytime you see that something's been named as a module, you know that that is going to point to content from the anatomy and physiology app. You can always check your source here. Um, also, this is another place you can check to see if it's been published. You can see here its status is draft. It has not yet been published. It's published, it'll say published. Um, and your available and due dates are set there as well. Uh, so then uh, we know we're going into the a and app if I follow this link. All of this is editable, so you can edit um, the name of the assignment, the you know learning objectives that you would like the students to think about as they're going through the module. Um, we, as kind of standard text here, we put in tips on how to navigate uh, once you're inside the apps, but you can edit that to be whatever works best for you. You can also edit the assignment content. So say you are doing a section on the axial skeleton, but um, you know you don't need the occipital bone landmarks. So we'll, we'll take that out and we don't need the temporal bones, we'll take that out. So you can customize the content in that way. And then just click continue, oops, up here at the top. So now here we are with those specific things that we've selected rather uh, than just kind of the header um, in this assignment now. Um, so why don't we just jump into one of these. We'll go into the skull and this is gonna pull us right into the a and app, which is set up kind of like a virtual textbook. Um, so you'll see different sections um, with different types of learning materials in here. Uh, and these little icons will tell you, you know, what to expect when you click on that. Actually, this didn't bring me in, this brought me into the app, but let me just try that again here, sorry. There we go. So um, I had the app already open and I think I just clicked to the app rather than going through the assignment. Um, so the assignment will bring you to the specific portion of the app that you're covering uh, for that section. So this is uh, one of our 3D models. Um, so you can manipulate that. Um, you can select and get more information about that, get the definition of uh, the pronunciation. You can also down here either fade that structure or hide it completely so you can see inside. Um, and then you can zero in on different topics, the cranial bones or the facial skeleton um, and highlight that. So then if we jump back out, let's head back to the menu. You'll see these are the other assignments that we've assigned already for this course. So the students would know that they need to go through, you know, 10, 2, 10, 3, 10, 4. Well, nope, not 10, 4, because we pulled out occipital bone landmarks. Um, so they would skip that one. Um, but here it'll show you what type of content you're going to see. So this box indicates that you're going to see a 3D model, just like the one that I, we were just in. And I'm not seeing other types of, so I'm gonna jump back to cells and tissues uh, just to show you what these other icons are that you'll 
run into in the A and P app. Um, these are always going to be short little videos. These usually last about 30 to 45 seconds. Um, and they're beautiful animations. They all have narration um, along with the text of the narration next to them. Um, you can. Uh, a lot of people use these either live in lecture or just as an assignment for the students to review on their own. Um, so then we, the other types of content that you'll see is just slides, single slides or a tour of multiple slides. Uh, and so that's what that icon represents is that it's just gonna be a still image. Um, a lot of people ask me if, if they can edit this. Uh, I mean, you can, not directly in the app, but you can pull an image of this and, you know, say if you wanted to have the students identify these structures, you could block out the label next to it, take a screenshot and kind of do it, build it, build it that way. Um, any questions there on just the AMP app in general and, and how to, what your students will see when they click on a module? So it does look like we have another question um, from Michael and it says, will teachers and students have access to the mobile apps as well? Um, and I could answer that. Um, so the answer is yes. So with Courseware, um, teachers and students will have permanent downloads of each of the five apps. Um, so as Kate is showing here, she's on the My Apps tab. And if you scroll down, um, that's where you'll find those mobile applications um, and your specific credentials to log into those apps. Right, and so the, these credentials, a lot of people will uh, think it, that they need to put in their courseware username when downloading the apps. Um, so we do just like to highlight that uh, it, this is a one-time username and password, and that's just so that when you're going to download these apps onto your mobile device, it's not going to uh, have you pay. Um, so depending on how your account is set up, uh, but that's all right here under my apps. We have a second uh, question if we are okay with that question um, and ready to move on. The next one is, um, can you show where to go to modify module content again? So I think on a general assignment of going through that would be awesome. Sure, all right, so let's jump in here. Uh, so we're gonna open up that module again. Um, and so there's kind of two levels of editing and assignment. There's like the, the surface edit, which is where you can um, kind of just change the, the name, the dates, that kind of stuff. And then there's the deep dive edit where you're gonna act, actually edit the content of the assignment. So you have to do just that kind of next level click. And that's gonna bring you in here uh, where you can select or remove sections of the app. Um, so this is pulling everything. These are all of those sections that we were just looking at in the app. This all matches up. Um, so we were in 10, which is the ax axial skeleton. And you can click on that and see, there we are, 10.1, 10.2, 10.3, 10.4. No, we don't want that. 10.5, no, we don't want that. Um, and so you can add and remove that content here pretty quickly you can see you know if you are selecting a whole section and you click on it you'll see all the different things that will be listed in that section and if you don't want all of those you can go in here and then only include the specific sections that will be helpful for you in your course um, so you can see here this dash is letting me know that i have some of the uh sections for types of bones and some of the axial skeleton content, this check mark here is telling me that we have all uh, of the assets of the appendicular skeleton. So everything here is highlighted and selected, lots of content. Uh, but if we don't want say much about the feet, we'd remove that and you can see it's now a dash, meaning that not everything is, uh, from that section is selected. Um, and then once you edit all that, make it be only what you would like to see. I'm actually gonna, oops, just have this be types of bones with a with a couple of things selected, just so we can see quickly. There we go. Now we have those 8.1 through 8.5. Um, and this is gonna tell us here's an illustration. And then all four of these are 3D views. 
Uh, so you'd be able to interact with those and 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 select do the hide and fade all of that that we went over. Does that answer the that question? There was a follow up to it asking if you can do that for the labs as well. And Patrick, I just messaged you back in the chat to see if you were talking about the PDF lab documents that are um, sometimes incorporated into those modules. Um, those lab PDFs um, are it's a PDF. So uh, Courtney and Matt and Kate, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, if you download that lab PDF and you have a uh, software that you can edit a PDF on your computer, yes, you can edit that. Um, I know a lot of professors have found their ways to edit these PDFs, but these technically aren't editable. Um, your students can go ahead and submit their answers on the documents themselves. They have the typing boxes in them. Uh, so that your students can actually type their answers in and then save that as their own file to submit uh, to your LMS for grade, um, but not necessarily fully editable, if that concludes that. And Courtney, correct me if I'm wrong. No, you, you are right. Although I will say that um, coming uh, soon to a uh, courseware platform near you um, are uh, fully editable labs that we um, have, uh, we, we have taken those PDFs and we have totally correlated them to what we have available in the app. So we treat all of those lab activities um, like um, like assignments that that you would you know publish, so you would be able to edit all of the content uh, within them. They're not available quite yet, but um, we do have a, um, an update uh, coming. You may have received um, an email from me if um, if you are a current courseware user about um, some scheduled downtime this week to um, to implement um, some some pretty big updates to the platform. So. Um, so yeah, so so the answer is currently not not quite, but um, but coming soon. Yes, you you sh you will be able to edit those uh those labs. So stay tuned. Right. So yeah, that's those are the lab activities, and those that like uh like we've mentioned don't point to any of the apps. They just point to a PDF. Um, so those are editable, like Carly said. If you download them, you can, you know, use Adobe or something or, or any PDF editor to move um, pages and remove pages and add, or move them around. Um, so yeah, so we covered modules and we covered lab activities. The, oops, these don't have, there we go. There's the anatomy ID. That's usually above the practice quizzes. So I'm gonna just quickly move that. Uh, the anatomy ID assignments uh, always are going to point to the human anatomy atlas. And the thing with these is they do need uh, a little bit of attention before, you know, they're ready to be published for the students. And that's because, um, you know, all we would need to do here is let the student know what they are expected to do once they get into the atlas. Um, so what, what structures are, do we want them to to be able to identify uh, during you know, this section. So you would just, usually people have a list of structures uh, you know, either in their syllabus or on hand somewhere. You can copy and paste that, drop it right here into the description, um, which you would access just by clicking edit here. Um, and then if you click on the assignment, it will navigate you right into the atlas. Just checking my notes to make sure I've hit all the topics before I moved on to uh, navigating Atlas itself. Um, so yeah, the anatomy ID. These are these are like the uh, uh, dissection content. Uh, learning to identify the different structures that the students will encounter um, in this in this model. So just some general kind of tips on how to move around uh, once you're in the atlas. You can click and drag the model to pivot them around a central point. If you right click and drag, it will pan the model rather than pivot. That also works uh, if you left click and hold your mouse, you can pan it there. I like to use the left click click, that works well for me. Um, if you or your students uh, use a touchpad, 
um, like on a laptop or, or an iPad or something like that, uh, we've gotten feedback that sometimes navigating can be not as intuitive as we'd like it to be. Uh, never fear. <laughs> we do have this wonderful joystick here, this virtual joystick that you can toggle on. Um, and right now I'm pointing at something that might be underneath the image of me. Um, so if you move, if you move those little videos, uh, you'll see the settings cog right here. Uh, you click on that or, or the settings gear. Uh, if you click on that, you'll see the controls and you can toggle on that joystick, uh, toggle that on and off. And that's really helpful when using a touchpad because you can do all of your zoom, you can pan and you can pivot all right there. So if you're ever having trouble with the responsiveness of a laptop or something like that, uh, just toggle that on and that, that can be really helpful. Another thing I like to do is if, uh, say we're up here, we're talking about, you know, the skull and someone asks a question about, you know, something down on the ankle. If you double click on that, it will zoom you to a, a clear view of that structure, zoom you in. And then if you pivot, you are now pivoting around that structure rather than, you know, a central point of the, of the model. Um, so that can be really helpful if you're trying to move around quickly. See, now let's double click up here and jump to the radius. I just had to check. <laughs> um, so once you have a structure selected, you, you get this uh, wonderful little menu that pops up. It'll go away if nothing's selected. So if you're ever like, where'd that go? Make sure that you have something selected on the model itself. Um, and uh, here's where you would see the definition, associated pathologies, the pronunciation for that structure. And then this is the details tab. Uh, and that icon will change depending on the type of structure that you have, but it's always the detail tab and it always does the same thing, which is to bring you into an isolated view of that structure. Uh, so here we have um, the isolated view and it's showing us the bony la landmarks for this bone. And um, you can of course select one of those and get the pronunciation and the definition here. You could also, if we deselect that, uh, click this button, which allows you to view the muscle attachments for that bone. And uh, one of the neat things you can do is just click on that. Ooh, let me pan. I am in a weird view. There we go. Click on that and it'll start pulling in the muscles uh, so that you can see a real view of how that muscle is attaching to that bone and how um, what that relation is. If you want to get out of that isolated view, you would just click this exit button and it'll bring you right out. Um, so that does look different if it's a muscle that we have selected. So I'll show you really quick. Um, and down here is the systems tray. So if you ever need to quickly add in uh, something right now, we clearly only have uh, bones and cartilage, I think, ligaments. Yep. Uh, selected. And so I want to now select a muscle. So I'm going to add the muscular system in and uh, those muscles will appear on the model. So the same thing, you can select that structure. Um, you'll, you'll get all the same uh, type of content here in this menu, except this icon no longer looks, you know, like the picture with the colorful bones, uh, but rather just a pin. But it's going to do the same thing, bring us into an isolated view. Uh, only this time with a muscle, it will also bring, um, you know, this, the skeletal attachment points um, at, underneath it as well, so that you can then see related content if you want to see a, an animation of that muscle in action. Um, you, you can also click here to include the blood supply and innervation as well. Um, so both detail tabs slightly different, um, but both have a lot of, of kind of great information in them. So again, if you need to get out of that isolated view, you just click exit and it brings us right back. Um, of course, there's the dissect tool. So you can click it and quickly dissect down. You can also do uh, multi-select. So you could say, um, highlight certain structures that you'd like uh, either to remove by clicking hide or fade, 
or you can actually click this button here, which is isolate mode. And now we are seeing only those structures. So that's kind of a neat thing, um, depending on, you know, if you were live in the class and, and you wanted to specifically talk about the relationship between two structures, quickly turn on the multi-select and then take a look in that isolate mode to look at those structures only. Um, and click it again to get out. You're about to exit. Yes, that's what I want. And it'll bring you back. So, and if you're ever clicking around in here and you accidentally dissect something you to remove it uh, that you didn't intend to, uh, there's this wonderful little history tool where you can always undo. Uh, or if you know you need to refresh completely, you want to start over with the view that you had when you started the assignment. You can click that refresh button. It brings us right back. Um, there's, there's a lot of really great little tips and, and, and nuggets of information here on the Atlas, um, but I think we'd want to do more of a deep dive uh, to get into those. And also on the um, webinars, there's some really great next level navigation uh, videos um, that, that will kind of get you that next level. Um, but that's just some basic navigation there. So anytime you see an anatomy ID, uh, assignment. Sorry, I'm just jumping back now to courseware. Uh, it's going to point to the human anatomy atlas, and you just want to identify the structures that you're expecting the students to be able to um, to be able to identify for the quiz or whatever activity they're doing. Uh, I just want to pause because that was a lot with the uh, atlas navigation, um, and see what kind of questions I've been seeing that chat pop up. Um, Kate, I think we did miss a question a little bit ago about the bony landmarks in the quizzing format. Um, uh, the question was if we had um, any quizzes with bony landmarks intertwined into those quizzes. Um, I don't know if you can go ahead and show that really quickly for um, this. I program. believe, yes, um, specifically like a, a bony landmark quiz. Yes, I want to say probably a dissection one would be the one that we would be looking at, I think. Okay, so let's see. Well, we already have a graded quiz assignment pulled in because in this skeletal section. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see if we have a bony landmark quiz. So dissection quizzes. So you know what I could do? Um, just jump right into the quiz bank here. And this is actually good because we were going to talk about quizzes next. Um, so right now I just jumped into the quiz bank. Uh, and here you can quickly filter out uh, the type of quiz that we're looking for. So because we know that we want to have a 3D model that we're interacting with uh, to select certain structures um, like the bony landmarks, we would filter by dissection. Um, and then let's see the skeletal system and let's see uncategorized. Let's see what we have here. So I'm not seeing bony landmark specific content, um, but you can create content. And I'm going to make a note to see if we do have a pre-made bony landmark quiz, because I feel like we should. It's just I might not be finding it. Um, and then we can follow up and send you send you more information on that. What I was also going to say is I was just searching while you were too, Kate. Um, if you go in to create your own new quiz um, and you filter it to dissection as the type of quiz that you want to create, um, and then filter it to skeletal system once you get to the next page. Um, yep. And then you can search for keyword, just type in landmark. That will actually pop up all of the possibility of um, a bony landmark dissection quiz question. And then you can go ahead and either clone those questions to create your own and edit it, or you can always create your own if you don't like the ones that are uh, provided here. You are very welcome. <laughs> Right, and so if you did want to um, quickly make these into a, a quiz, uh, because we cl clicked uh, create new, so you can just start selecting the questions you want to have on that quiz. Add a couple more down here, and then click continue there. Um, and then you would select your topic. Um, this is skeletal subtopic 
I'd, I'd put that, I mean, types of bone, bone shape. You, you would put the most relevant <laughs> um, and the blooms level and bony landmarks. To answer your question, Ben, that is correct. So those are not visible to the students unless they are in the quiz. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Actually, right. They so they'd have to, that would have to be published and assigned. And sorry, I interrupted somebody. No, no, no worries. In addition to what both of you just said, um, you can always check what's available to a student by toggling your student view at the top of your screen once you're inside your course. Um, and that will show you, it takes away on your left-hand side, it takes away that quiz bank and question bank. So your students will never have access to any of those questions or quizzes. So they don't get to see those right. questions, which is an awesome attribute. Right, so right now we're in instructor view and that all of that is visible. Student preview, they don't have it. They only have my apps and you know the stuff that would be pertinent to them. So yeah, and if you are making a, a custom quiz, um, the first thing you would always want to do is build all of those questions into the question bank. Uh, once you have them here, you can then go and compile those all into a single quiz that you can assign. Um, but until the question lives in the question bank, we can't add it to a quiz. So that's why the first thing you would want to do uh, is, is build in all your questions. Um, but we do have, uh, as with most things, many, many, many uh, pre-built things, uh, pre-built quizzes that you can use, uh, clone these and uh, make a kind of your own version of it. Um, let's see, Kate's, there's Kate's custom quiz. We can edit that change the questions, remove questions, um, and you can pool questions uh, and randomize their question order. Uh, so a lot of times what I'll see is uh, professors will put a large number of questions in like 40, 50, 60 questions, and then have it pool uh, to only give each student 20 or 30 questions, something like that. Um, that way it's more likely that every single student is getting a, a unique quiz, um, which can help uh, in, a, in a virtual world when, when trying to make sure that everyone's keeping on the straight and narrow, I guess. <laughs> um, so yeah, so those are really great functions. And sorry, Courtney or Carly? Carly. <laughs> Um, but we had a question actually in the chat box that I did answer, but if you don't mind, can you show how to create a kind of practice quiz that's customized, not the ones that are already preloaded into the applications, but to show how to create a graded quiz that would be more of a practice sense um, where you can create an unlimited amount of attempts for those students. Um, I think that'd be a great opportunity for many professors to see. Okay, so so how to edit a uh, number of quiz attempts and, and that type of thing? That'd be lovely. Okay, um, so we'll jump back in. Mm. Trying to think the best way to go about that. So we'll jump back into a course here, go into Memlers, and we'll take a look. So we do have, uh, and this is part of kind of the naming conventions, we do have practice quizzes, uh, and these are preset in the apps themselves. They're built into the, the app. Um, we can't edit the questions. We can't make any changes to those. Um, and of course, the graded quizzes, you can make those whatever learning level um, you'd like for that particular uh, you know, class or student or however you're setting all that up. Um, so we do have the, the pre-built questions, but if you, or quizzes, um, and so if we wanted to go in here and select, we'd click edit, and here's where we could edit the point value, um, whether this is gonna be displayed as percentage points, how many attempts the student's gonna get or if they get unlimited attempts, um, and what, which of those attempts, which score are we going to keep? Um, here you can set a time limit uh, and I'll show you in the roster how you can um, make accommodations for some students who would either get time and a half or, or double time on a timed quiz. Um, 
you can also set how much feedback you'll get uh, or this rather the student will get during the quiz either at the end or after each question um, and then you can decide do you want them to show the correct answers uh, or don't show the correct answers at all and edit the description so that's one of those things that live in that surface level edit and then you can always do the deep dive edit to edit the exact actual content itself. Um, and so this is listing all of these quizzes are living um, under that one assignment for the appendicular skeleton right here. So you can see it has all of those quizzes. And then you can go into the to the deep dive and say, you know, I'm only doing joints and get rid of the quizzes you're not using. Um, and so this is how you would do it if, if you've made a custom custom quiz um, to be like a practice level, entry level quiz, uh, you would just first create your questions, put those in the question bank, then compile those questions into your quiz. Um, and once that's in the quiz bank, you can go ahead and uh, create that as an assignment. So I'll show you how to do that as well. Um, so let's go ahead and save this. So now we see instead of that long list, we're just doing the joints here on this quiz. Um, so that's in the deeper edit. Uh, if you wanted to take that custom quiz that, you know, that kind of practice level quiz that you've created um, and assign it here, all you would need to do uh, is go into the course, click create new assignment. Um, and here's where you can uh, create an assignment pointing at any of the content in any of our apps, uh, whether that be the AMP app or the Atlas or um, one of the other three apps we didn't really get a chance to touch base on here. Uh, but for our purposes right now, you, we would say go ahead and uh, point at the graded quiz bank. We want this to be a graded quiz. Um, also, just while we're on this screen, I'd like to highlight here, you can also uh, create an assignment using a file. So you have a PDF or something you've been using for years. You, you know, you get great results uh, when you use that. You could upload that here. Or of course, if there was a link to some outside uh, source, maybe the, a YouTube video that um, you found that's really helpful, you can link that out as an assignment here as well. Uh, for now, we'll go ahead and assign a graded quiz. Uh, custom quiz. And it brings you right back here and we will select Kate's custom quiz, which I have uh, created here and click continue and assign that week one. There we go. And we're going to select the folder that we want that to uh, go into, and I'm going to put it into the getting started folder. I'm going to say this is worth one point, uh, and it's going to be a percentage because I just want the students to get credit that they did it. I don't want to actually score it. Um, we'll give them a single attempt and no, no timed. And so that's fine there. Now, actually, I don't want to publish it. I just want to save it. I'll publish it later. So now if we go back to our assignments, and to open up getting started with visible body. Um, oh, I thought I put it in that. Did I not put it in that one? Oh, <laughs> I must not have clicked there because it did just go down here. So I can grab that from the bottom and drop it in there. And drop. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and drop. Why is this happening? I always say to look for the blue bar, Kate, when it like- I know, yeah, yeah and I'm not seeing it at all on any of them. It might just be Wi-Fi. Yeah, okay, so that's the blue bar that Carly's talking about. For some reason, it's not popping up up here at the top, um, but I think it's just because I'm trying to maybe scroll it. I'm not sure. Um, Yeah, so that's happening. <laughs> so I, I can look into that. Let me just, come on, no, no, a little bit. No, okay. Uh, 
Um, well, I'm, something's happening, obviously, but I'm not quite sure why. So normally you'd be able to just drop that right into the um, to the assignment. Did that answer the question about creating and creating a practice quiz using the graded quiz bank? We did get a follow up question to it, um, but also it was. Um, who is the one that I wanted this to be answered for? Um, I, that definitely answers at least what I was asking for as the as a panelist. But the follow up question is, once I create a quiz, can it be exported? Or if I teach the same course next semester with different students, is it uh, uh, preserved. I am asking because when I create a quiz in Blackboard, for instance, I can import it into the same course for the next term, so I don't have to recreate. How does it work in Visible Body? Right. So what I like to do and uh, recommend to people is to have like a, a kind of master course, a course that you never intend to actually invite any students to. Um, and that's where you just keep everything updated and clean, make it all uh, exactly how you would want it at the start of each semester. And then once you have that, um, and you can name it whatever you want. I thought I had one that I had named master course uh, down here, but I don't. Um, so what you can do then is uh, just take that course and make a copy and then just name it um, spring 21 AMP. So then it's just everything exactly as you had it in that you know master file and then just uh, creating a new section uh, for this coming semester. It's as quick as that. Okay. Um, um, we actually have um, one more question uh, from Angie, which is, uh, do you need your LMS system when uh, when quizzes are assigned to obtain their grades? And I'm pretty positive the answer is no. All student grades should report to the grade book that is in courseware. What I think would be awesome to show is the different options that we have for exportation process if you do want to um, put that into, say, an LMS. Right, so here we're in the, the grade book. Uh, grade book in this class that um, I assigned to some of my coworkers. Um, and if I wanted to pull this into say Blackboard or Moodle or, or whatever LMS I was working with, um, you would just up here export that CSV really quickly. Um, and we have them pre-made too so that you can you know make sure it's formatted right. Um, so if you're doing Canvas, you just download that. It pops up right here. I'm not sure if you can see that because it's not technically part of my browser, um, but it downloads that. And then you would just follow the instructions on your LMS to upload that file into your gradebook on that platform. But it's just right here in the gradebook and you can pull them um, right here. Oh, and I, I mentioned I would show you something earlier and I completely forgot. Um, if you go right here to the class roster, Here's where you can add your multipliers, e either these standard ones that we've uh, preloaded, or you know you can make a, a specific, you know, one two point five or one point two five or however um, how much you want to um, allow, and then you can also transfer the student or drop the student from your course. All right. And then just kind of as our last last thing um, is this wonderful, wonderful link here. And this again, um, and as Carly, Carly highlighted earlier, uh, is not something that is available when the students are looking. Um, it is only for instructors. And I highlight that because when you follow this link, um, it does have the full list of lab activities and answer keys. So just be careful not to share this link with your students, um, but uh, that that is all listed here. So this is a fantastic resource, uh, whether you you need support and you have questions and you, know, you need help in that way, whether there's um, content or supplemental content that you wanted to add to your course. We have a lot of content that you can use. Um, it's all here. Our, I mean, our goal is to try to make 
things easy and helpful and um, available. Uh, so we also have these wonderful free educational materials. Uh, if you're having like computer browser error messages, that kind of thing, uh, just follow this link and you can go uh, submit a support ticket with our IT help um, who are fabulous and answer really quickly. Uh, so they'll be able to assist you there. Oops. Kate, we had one last question. Actually, um, questions. actually uh, before we even get to the questions, I do want to let everybody know that um, this uh, link is specifically um, in courseware and on courseware only. We do have something similar on our website um, that does have lab activities, but the answer keys are not available. Um, and they can't be found um, by, you know, like a Google search. Uh, we, we keep those uh, kind of locked down uh, so they don't fall into the wrong hands. Um, but uh, you can access this. So, so when we say that you should not share this link, um, we mean it because students will have access to everything. But if, um, if you did want to have them, you know, complete a, uh, a lab activity or find those lab activities on their own. If you go to visiblebody.com slash resources, they will have all of those lab activities without any of the answers. Right. Um, so for your purposes, you could go here and just download those. And then, you know, when you're creating a new assignment, you can upload it as a file, um, which we touched on it. And when we were creating that quiz, um, just right underneath where it said my content. And then Carly, you were saying there were questions? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, I, I answered one of them. Sorry, sorry oh. Carly, <laughs> if, you wanted, to, oh, if you wanted to take the second one. Um, are there any lesson plans or unit plans available that might reflect sequence or a pacing guide? Um, and I think I sort of answered a little bit of this prior in one of my messages um, that we don't necessarily have a tracking process to see that the, the um, time that students spend on a specific module or lesson, but we there is a checklist within the A and P application that your students can individually um, see their progress. It doesn't necessarily get sent to the professor, but the students can track their own progress. Um, uh, actually, it's under the second tab at the top left, if you see what Kate is doing. Um, and obviously, it has a checklist to go through those specific modules. Um, but in terms of pacing guide, Courtney, I feel like this is in your realm. If I don't think we have necessarily a full pacing guide of like what they should spend on it, um, I want to ask Lori and maybe I'll get back, but you might know that. Yeah, um, I, I could certainly ask Lori. I think um, as of right now, the answer is no. Right. But um, in, in the follow-up email that I send um, tomorrow morning that will have the, the link to this recording, I can include some more information about pacing guides if that might, um, if that might help anybody. Thank you. And thank you, Patrick, for the question. Yes, thank you, Patrick. just muted myself. Um, we have we have one minute left. So um, if anybody has any further questions for us now, um, now's the time, but feel free to contact us, you know, at any point um, at, you know, support at visiblebody.com with any questions. Um, we are totally happy to, uh, to help or to, um, to set up individual um, sessions with you to, you know, go a little more in depth for a uh, for, for certain topics. So, um, but, but I, I, I think um, if, uh, unless there, there are any other questions, um, then I, I think, I think y'all are free to go. <laughs> um, and, uh, and thank you guys so much for, um, for joining us. Um, we were so happy to have you. And um, again, I will be sending uh, the recording of this um, tomorrow via email. If for any reason you don't receive it, check out our YouTube channel. We post all of our webinars and our office hours to the channel. So it's always available. And um, we are actually holding two more webinars for, um, for different topics this week. On, um, on Thursday, we will be uh, talking about um, well, one of the webinars is for quizzing. One of the uh, 
webinars is for labs. Um, so let me just double check the dates and times. Okay, so on Thursday um, at 3 p.m. Eastern, we will be talking about how to assign interactive quizzes in courseware. And on Friday at 12 p.m. Eastern, uh, we will be talking about editing pre-made courses in courseware. So going a little more in depth into both of those topics and we hope you join us for those. Um, otherwise, uh, have a great rest of your day and uh, thank you so much for joining us and we will see you next time.